prices for food over the next 20 or 30 years will double. This is because demand is going to grow between 70 and 80 percent and that in turn is based on the fact that the population of the earth is supposed to swell by about 30 percent growing from 7 billion to 9 billion. According to our next speaker, Paul Greenberg, there are four main sources, four main sources of commercially available fish. They are salmon, cod, tuna, and sea bass, and they are either being hunted to oblivion, aquafarmed, or genetically modified. While much of the world's population relies on fish for protein, and as we can see, the endless fecundity of the oceans may be close to an end. Without fish, what are they going to eat? Paul. Thank you. Uh, thanks. I, you know, I, I, first time in Toronto, but I have this strange sense that I've been here before. Um, uh, the combination of the Aaron Copeland music, and then the lady who crossed the ocean in the rowboat, speaking before me, and then the crow made the hook, and the leech on the eye, and then I suddenly realized that this is the exact place I saw in my dream where I'm talking before, you know, several hundred people naked. So, um, so I'm, I'm glad to be back and with my clothes on, so I feel that's an improvement. Um, so the book I wrote is called Four Fish, and um, a lot of people ask me, you know, why four? A um, few different reasons that, you know, are good for print, but the real reason it was because of an anxiety attack. Um, this crowd looks to me like a crowd that probably has either written a book or is thinking about writing a book. Um, I, uh, you know, had been writing for the New York Times for some time and writing about fish, because I'm a fisherman, I grew up fishing, I love fishing, and at um, a certain point the agent got very excited, let's sell a book, and we did the proposal, and there was like a bidding war, and it was really great, and I was so excited. I woke up the next morning after signing the contract and realized, oh my god, I'm going to have to write this book. Um, and uh, the original book wasn't called uh, Four Fish, it was actually called The Fish on Your Plate. And um, I came across a very disturbing statistic as I was sort of trying to calm my anxiety, and that was that the, we eat from a single taxonomic or order, uh, the order Persiformes, generally speaking, when we eat from fish. And I came across this horrifying statistic that um, the taxonomic order Persiformes is the most species-rich uh, order of vertebrates on the planet, more than 5,000 species. And so I read that and I thought, great. I'm going to write a book called 5,000 Fish. And, uh, well, if I had written that, I don't think I'd be here today. None of you would be looking at me. Um, so I realized I needed to m sort of narrow it down um, and to try and figure out some way to kind of parse this huge mess of situation we had with the ocean. Um, and I started looking for models. Um, how many people have read uh, Michael Pollan, uh, Omnivore's Dilemma or Botany of Desire? Right, good number of you. So um, Michael had done, um, in Botany of Desire, um, he described the human relationship with plants through four different plants. Um, Omnivore's Dilemma, relationship with the food system through four meals. So I thought, well, you know, work for Michael, uh, international bestseller, um, I'll give it a shot. Um, uh, but I, th I thought a little, it was a little cheese ball to kind of just, you know, there's a fine line between homage and, 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 and plagiarism. Um, so uh, I thought, okay, well, how can we, can we back this up? Um, and I started reading, and reading actually is good for anxiety, if, as long as you don't come across another Persiform statistic. Um, and I came across this um, interesting book called A History of the Domestication of Mammals by an Oxford professor. And in it she said, um, in the, uh, you know, 10,000 years ago, in the era before we became um, farmers, uh, if you looked in the middens of Neolithic humans, you would find several dozen species of animals. Uh, in, in those middens. Um, muskrat, lynx, lion, you didn't matter if it was herbivore or carnivore, we ate it. If it moved, we ate it. If it had meat, we ate it. But by the time of Christ, we're down to four. Cattles, pig, goats, sheep, right? So I thought, okay, that, that makes some sense. I, I could see that. And I started to think, well, well, does that work in other realms? And at the time, um, I was actually doing an article about cod aquaculture, and I had a meeting scheduled with uh, Mark Kurlansky. Anybody read Cod by Mark Kurlansky or Salt? Right, great, great books. And Mark was working on his oyster book at the time about New York oysters. Turns out, actually, um, the average New Yorker in the 19th century ate somewhere on the order of six to 700 local New York Harbor oysters every year. All gone. Anyway, uh, Mark at the time had all these menus laid out before him, and he was saying, look at these menus. Look at all the birds we ate. 
you know, uh, in 19th century. Pheasant, quail, woodcock, grouse, all these different water birds. Again, by the age of modern animal husbandry in the 1940s, 50s, we're down to four. Chickens, turkeys, ducks, geese. So I thought, okay, that's going somewhere. And then I came across, if you ever want to sort of poke around and see what's going on with fisheries, um, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization does a, a report every few years called the Status of World Aquaculture and Fisheries. And in it, I read this sort of startling statistic in the preface. And also, you should keep in mind, journalists only read the prefaces of, um, of scientific articles. So if you're a scientist, just make the preface really good. Um, and in the preface, it said, in the next 10 years, for the first time, uh, farmed fish is like, or farmed seafood is likely to surpass wild seafood in the marketplace. So I thought, this is, this is big. This is actually a very interesting moment. This is something that has not happened in 10,000 years. Um, and then the last thing that sort of clicked in, you know, when I was sort of in the sort of book proposal phase, um, the editor uh, from, an editor from Press Just Row wanted to talk to me, and we were talking about, you know, the decline of the oceans, oh, bluefin tuna, oh, codfish, blah, 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 getting very sad and sad. And I was saying, yeah, there's, you know, we could talk about all these problems. And she's like, yeah, yeah, I really like the sound of it. And then she goes, will there be recipes? <laughs> <laughs> and I... And I realized, actually, I feel like I'm in a comfortable place in today's proceedings because we had this whole session earlier about animals, and now we're going into food. But fish are somewhere in between animals and food. Um, and I suddenly realized that the way most humans, whereas I'm a fisherman, I love fish, I love wild fish, I love being in a river, I love being on the ocean, the way that most humans approach fish is as meat. And so as I started to think about four, the number four, the magic number four, and as I started going to um, fish markets, I started realizing that there was a kind of a series of what I came to call flesh archetypes emerging in the modern day fish market. Um, go to any fish market, go to a seafood restaurant. Um, I'm going to exclude all the invertebrates, that's my, probably my next book. But um, you look at the vertebrates, and you're always going to see these four flesh archetypes no matter where you go. You always want to see something pink and succulent that you could bake or smoke. It's going to be your salmon. You're always going to want to see something white and flaky uh, that you could deep fry, put on a sandwich. That would be your cod. Uh, you're always going to want to see something a little bit more substantial uh, that you could broil, a white-fleshed fish probably, and that fish would be called a sea bass or a snapper. Um, I should point out here, there are, I've counted eight taxonomic families with fish in them called sea bass, and they're often as closely related as I am to a lemur. Um, so, so sea bass is not really a real word, and so you know, when Moses was before saying there are four types of fish, well, there are four archetypes that really define how we eat from the ocean. Um, finally, the last flesh archetype that you're likely to see, and this is a relatively new thing, uh, is tuna, is that, you know, that red, steaky thing that you're going to want to either sushi up or have on a, a, a grill or a barbecue type situation. So there I was, I had my four flesh archetypes, um, half wild, half farmed, uh, evidence of huge collapse in the ocean. Um, good place to go. Um, so, and that pretty much set me out across the world looking at these flesh archetypes, following them through their different systems. Um, with salmon, what I found, which is you know, really the most kind of dramatic change that we've seen in fish and seafood in the last um, 50 years, salmon is really the mode I like to call delete and replace. Um, salmon, you know, in, up until um, probably the 19th century, um, salmon were actually somewhat abundant in colonial New England. And you guys actually even had salmon in Lake Ontario. Um, Atlantic salmon were native to Lake Ontario. They spawned in rivers like the Salmon River, going from Pulaski, New York, into the, into the lake here. Um, but a series of um, events happened over the last two or three hundred years. Mill dams put in place, block tributaries where salmon could spawn. Um, but then you also had on top of all these environmental things, uh, right around 1940, 1950, um, an extinction event happened, um, which was that a small group of Faroese fishermen from the Faroe Islands found the little place off of Greenland where every single Atlantic salmon goes to feed. And they fished it, and they fished it damn hard. And you can see on a graph, salmon, wild Atlantic salmon, just going boom, like this. And in fact, to the point where I'm 43 years old, when I was a kid, I remember growing up having Nova locks, Nova Scotia locks. Who remembers Nova Scotia locks, right? Totally wild fish back then. Locks, by the way, is from the Norwegian locks, which means salmon. Um, anyway, that was a totally wild fish. Today, Atlantic salmon is commercially extinct. Now, it doesn't mean they're extinct. It means that there are not enough of them out there to make it worthwhile to go fishing for them. 
At the same time, you had the rise of aquaculture. Salmon are actually quite easy to aquaculture, relatively speaking, because they hatch out of that big, nutrient-rich egg, and you can immediately transition them to industrial feed. And what you see in the 50s and 60s and 70s is this ramping up of salmon. Then you also see selective breeding programs starting with salmon that improve what's called the feed efficiency of salmon. So it goes from a period at the beginning of salmon farming where it took six pounds of wild fish to grow a single pound of salmon to something like under two pounds to grow a single pound of wild salmon. But all the while, you see Atlantic salmon going downhill, farm salmon, uh, wild salmon going downhill, farm salmon going uphill. And where we find ourselves today uh, is sort of salmon 2.0. Um, you guys in Toronto are kind of smack dab in the middle of sort of the, the, the salmon universe. To your east, you have um, uh, commercially extinct salmon. To the west, you have quite abundant Pacific salmon. But those are also on the ropes. Not physically yet, but it's getting there. Uh, a few years ago, um, a copper deposit was found underneath Bristol Bay, which is the largest remaining sockeye salmon run on Earth. 40 million fish migrate into Bristol Bay every year. And um, unfortunately, the copper deposit is worth $300 billion. Um, concentrations of copper in the water of two parts per billion are enough to throw off a salmon's migration ability. So this copper deposit extends beyond Bristol Bay in Alaska into the Canadian portion of salmon's range. And if large-scale copper exploitation goes on in those areas, we're going to lose <clears throat> potentially as much as 200 million pounds of salmon a year. At the same time, what's going on is genetically modified salmon is, is starting to rear its head. Um, what they've done with genetically modified salmon is they've taken Atlantic salmon, uh, already artificially selected Atlantic salmon, taken a growth gene from a Chinook Pacific salmon, put it in there, taken a regulator protein from a ocean pout, which by the way is not kosher, um, put it permanently in the on position, and then you get a fish that grows twice as fast as the already twice as fast growing selectively bred Atlantic salmon. If all the Canadian and American salmon farms switch to genetically modified salmon, we'll have 200 million more pounds of salmon a year. If we go through with these copper mines in the uh, Pacific, we'll lose about 200 million pounds. So it doesn't seem like there's, it's not necessarily a conspiracy between the genetically modified salmon people and the copper miners, but it does seem like a human tendency to try and kind of delete and replace with something that's more predictable than the natural world. The other fish I looked at <clears throat> very briefly uh, one was, as I said, sea bass, and I chose that one because of the name swapping that goes on. Um, around the early 80s, you see American striped bass, California white sea bass, Chilean sea bass all come onto the market in different ways, and population after population getting worn down and then replaced by the next thing. Uh, but along with that comes another sea bass that enters the, 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 uh, the picture, which is European sea bass. Who here's ever eaten a Branzino or a Lou de Mer or Bar, right? You probably all think that's a wild fish. Well, unfortunately, that's all farmed, all of it. It's all farmed, and it's all the creation of a huge Mediterranean fisheries collapse. Um, and in fact, one of the things that brought that fish to the market, that was, I consider the European sea bass a Rosetta Stone fish, because when we cracked that code, it meant that we could domesticate all of fish kind. Incidentally, the things that we used to crack that code was, remember I said the salmon hatches out of that nutrient-rich egg? Well, sea bass and all other fish, the Persiforms, hatch out of these tiny, tiny eggs, and they need to eat something alive the second they're born. What do they eat? Well, that was the big challenge. Uh, one of the things they eat is something called an artemia. It's a kind of shrimp. But those of you who remember your comic book days uh, early on in your lives might have ordered these. Um, they're called sea monkeys. Anybody? Or, come on. Who ordered sea monkeys? I did. <laughs> sea monkeys brought to Americans, Canadians, by a Jewish neo-Nazi, actually, who also invented the X-ray specs and was a promoter of um, divers who dove from um, you know, high dives into buckets. Um, interesting guy. But anyway, so that, was the, that fish pretty much opened up the whole potential for aquaculture. Any fish out there now can be tamed. Um, cod can be tamed. I've, I've been to cod farms, and I remember talking with these cod farmers how excited they were to bring cod, farm cod, onto the marketplace. But then I remember saying to this cod farmer in Norway, I said, what's the one danger for cod farming on the, on the horizon? And he looked at me with this sort of sad Nordic face, and he goes, tilapia. So <laughs> tilapia, as you probably know, um, is this fish that's taken America by storm, brought into, this, um, into these countries a lot through US Peace Corps workers, actually, who found it's this amazing fish you can throw into a pond. It eats all the algae and turns it into protein. Um, so, you know, going through, as we start to realize we could domesticate anything, choices start to emerge. 
There are some fish that work on the farm. The tilapia requires zero wild fish uh, to grow to maturity. Um, it grows to maturity in nine months. It's also highly invasive. If tilapia get out into the waters, into the wild, where temperatures don't go below 60 degrees, they'll basically take over the lake, which has actually happened all over South America. So with cod and tilapia, I won't go into the long story. You have to read my book, Four Fish, if you want to find out what really happened to cod. But it's another delete and replace thing where cod has really been overfished in its Atlantic, Atlantic range, and tilapia has come on as this sort of shadow character. Actually, if you want to look at sort of what happened to white fish, a great archetype is that great culinary high point of North America, the filet of fish sandwich. The filet of fish sandwich was originally halibut, then it became cod, now it is Alaska pollock. What will it be next? Maybe tilapia, who knows, I don't know. Anyway, the last fish that I did on the list was uh, tuna. And as I say, I'm a fisherman, really love wild fish, I love the experience of being out there in the wild. Um, but I always sort of had a kind of feeling like, fish were down there, I was up here, I tried hunting, I couldn't do it. When I killed a bird, it just left me with this sort of sad feeling. But fish, I was always somehow able to kind of suspend my feeling that you know, this was somehow not wildlife. And, and indeed, this is sort of backed up by culture. Think about the word seafood. Have you ever heard two more cruel English syllables? Seafood. Would we call everything that we eat on land, land food? All the animals? But yet, every single wild animal that gets lumped into seafood. And this is across culture. Francophones there will recognize, recommend, or recognize the, uh, the phrase fruit de mer, right? Fruit of the sea. Russians say darimuria, gifts of the sea. These are not animals, this is not wildlife, these are gifts, these are fruits, this is food. So with tuna, and in the tuna chapter of my book I go into it in greater detail, but I really looked a lot, particularly at bluefin tuna, and when you look at bluefin tuna, what they represent biologically, physically, they really represent something much bigger than seafood. Bluefin tuna, warm-blooded, do you know that? Bluefin tuna, swim at 40 miles an hour, 60, 70 kilometers an hour, cross the oceans, incredible, incredible, creatures. When they come out of the sea, it's like their skin is dancing with life. So, <coughs> you know, since the theme of this conference is sex, I'll leave with one image, which is, I actually don't tuna fish anymore. And, I, and, and the moment came to me very clearly. I was out with a, um, in, off North Carolina on a boat uh, chartered by Tagga Giant, which, which has been very heroically plotting the very elaborate migration patterns of the bluefin tuna. And, um, we, I caught one, I caught a bluefin, we pulled it in the door, and we were tagging them. And I go to tag it, and I just sort of prick the surface. And the scientist said, no, you gotta really stick it in. And actually after that, he got, I, I wrote about this in the New York Times, and he got a ribbing from it. Um, but anyway, so I really stuck it in, I stuck that tag in. And I could feel that needle going through this flesh. And it was for the first time I realized that this was not sushi, this was not seafood, this was an adaptation that allowed a warm-blooded creature to cross the ocean. So I'll leave with that. Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's his book. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Thank you. There's the book.